Welcome all of you to this, this meeting on global health security and how CDC can advance the prevent, detect, respond model in order to make the United States and the rest of the world safer from epidemic and, and pandemic threats. Uh, my name's Tom Kenyon. I'm the director of the Center for Global Health, and it's my pleasure to welcome you and, and, and moderate this, this opening session. I'd first like to welcome uh, those of you that you can't see who have joined us on, on the web the webcast that's available, uh, the outpouring of, of support and, and interest in this topic by a number of stakeholders has been uh, very uh, rewarding and uh, we're very pleased to see others wanting to uh, engage. It's really a pleasure to, to welcome a number of important leaders on global health security from our partner agencies who have who have traveled here today from, from Washington, D.C. Dr. Beth Cameron, the Director of Countering Biological Threats from the National Security Council. Ambassador Bonnie Jenkins, who serves as the Coordinator for Threat Reduction Programs in the Department of State. Ms. Kaya Lewis, who couldn't be with us today because of the weather, was intending to be here. Uh, she serves as the Counselor to the Secretary of Health and Human Services for Science and Public Health. We have Major General Jay Santee, who's the Deputy Director for the Defense Threat Reduction Agency and Department of Defense. Ms. Holly Wong, the Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Office of Global Affairs in Health and Human Services. And Dr. Dennis Carroll, the Director of Pandemic Influenza and Other Threats in USAID. And it's really through partnerships that global health work gets done. So, Thank you all for, for being here, and we're pleased to be partnering with your agencies to advance this important agenda. I'd also like to welcome the 51 CDC field staff from 18 countries. That includes teams of country directors, global disease detection center directors, field epidemiology training program advisors, lab experts, and, and others whose input will be so critical during this week on how to proceed with global health security within their country context and given the importance of, of country ownership. We really look forward to your contributions this week. This next slide, which I know is hard to read, uh, lists the, the 40 CDC offices, centers, and divisions who have registered for this, this meeting demonstrating not only the tremendous interest in this topic, but also the extraordinary breadth and depth of public health know-how and scientific expertise that we have at CDC on domestic and global health security. It's truly unparalleled anywhere, and this represents an extraordinary opportunity for our often disease-specific approach to support capacity building of public health systems amidst the cross-cutting and often unpredictable nature of global health security. A large number of CDC personnel who already have full-time jobs and often more have put many months of, of teamwork and effort into planning and organizing this meeting. We'll have an opportunity at the end to thank them as well, but I wanted to do it up front. Uh, in particular, we'd like to thank the Scientific Committee co-chairs, Jordan Tapro and Ron Rosenberg, the Logistic Committee co-chairs, Allison Kelly and Adam Brush, and also the breakout session coordinators, Scott Dowell and Tracy Treadwell, who've led the defining uh, the Global Health Security Framework track, uh, Kashef Ijaz and Dave Zwerdlow, who've led the disease-specific and systems approaches to prevention, disease, and response track, and Eric Kozowski and Ann Moen, who've led the country implementation uh, planning track. And just to point out, by, by using our own facilities and, and our own staff for all the logistics and planning around this meeting, we've managed to keep costs down to a minimum so that more is available to our programs in the, in the field. So let me conclude with summarizing the, the purpose of this meeting. First, we 
wish to convey and, and discuss very openly this week that, that global health security is a priority of the US government and how CDC is fitting into a whole of government approach. And to clear ex expectations from the headquarters perspective, what this means in terms of implementing evidence-based approaches and achieving measurable targets. Our most important output will be to advance planning for implementation in the field and to hear from field-based colleagues on how best to proceed based on the relationships you already have with ministries of health and other institutions and the work that you already have underway that we can build upon with this endeavor. We will also cover the technical areas that make up CDC's approach to global health security, and we look forward to everyone's important input into the draft technical guidance that will guide planning and implementation going forward in the field. We also expect colleagues to depart here on Friday with draft plans for next steps and opportunities to pursue when they return to country, recognizing the need for country-based and country-led planning with other agencies, ministries of health, and, and other partners. So in closing, this, this is an exciting time. The timing is right, and partner countries want to work with us in this kind of engagement that will prevent avoidable epidemics, detect, characterize, and report threats early, and respond more effectively and more rapidly in the course of um, disease recognition. It's truly an exciting opportunity for us all to contribute to a new initiative, and we look forward to your full participation throughout the work week. Thank you very much. So our CDC director, Dr. Frieden, has been fully committed to leading CDC's role in global health security, and we clearly are where we are, largely due to his efforts. Dr. Frieden is unable to be with us today, but he did want to share with you his thoughts on global health security and has recorded a message that we'll play for you now. Welcome to this important meeting on global health security. I really wish I could be there with you in person. I look forward to learning about how the meeting has advanced this important work. I also want to recognize the organizers of this meeting for their commitment and perseverance. We've come a long way. Thank you for getting us to where we are today. Global health security is important. It's exciting and it's unique. It's an important opportunity to make people, communities, and countries and the whole world safer from disease threats. Last month, I was privileged to moderate the launch of the U.S. government global health security agenda. The Directors General of the World Health Organization, the Food and Agriculture Organization, and the World Organization for Animal Health, as well as 29 countries, participated in this important event. It highlighted the role that public health has in ensuring safety and security around the globe. At the launch, senior officials acknowledged our common vulnerabilities. There's now a global consensus. We have threats from new infections, resistant infections, and the potential of intentional creation of new microbes. But there's also consensus that we have new opportunities, including a stronger global commitment, new and exciting technologies, and successes to build on because Success breeds success. We can take advantage of these opportunities to meet the challenges posed by infectious diseases and other threats and focus our attention on three key fronts. First, we need to detect threats earlier. Second, we need to respond effectively. And third, we need to prevent wherever possible to avoid catastrophes wherever that can happen. Over the next five years, the U.S. government is committed to working with at least 30 partner countries with at least 4 billion people in them to detect, respond, and prevent infectious disease threats. CDC will play an instrumental role in this effort. One of the goals of the global health security agenda is to help countries 
implement WHO's international health regulations in their core capacities. Although 194 countries are required to fully implement these IHRs, in 2012, fewer than one out of five even self-reported that they had done so. We at CDC are working closely with WHO to help countries reach this important goal. CDC works closely with WHO to help countries reach this important goal. A safer world is within reach. CDC's incredibly impressive range of subject matter expertise is critical in order for us to successfully implement the global health security agenda. Improving global health security means building on many of our existing efforts from combating antimicrobial resistance to strengthening laboratory systems, from enhancing public health emergency management capacity to strengthening global immunization programs. Strengthening global health security is the next big thing in global health. This effort will not only help countries around the world be safer, it will not only help the U.S. be safer, but perhaps most importantly, it will help countries around the world develop robust, resilient public health systems which are able to address any health threat a country faces. This week, you, as CDC experts from around the world and across the agency, have the unique opportunity to help shape the next steps to advance global health security as we move from the launch to the implementation. Thank you all for participating in this week's meeting. I look forward to moving the global health security agenda forward at CDC, with our U.S. government partners, and with partners all around the world. Thank you. Well, it's now my real pleasure to introduce our, our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Bill Fagey, for this opening session of the conference. Dr. Fagey's work and contributions to domestic and global health are indeed legendary. As an epidemiologist who worked in the successful campaign to eradicate smallpox in the 1970s, Dr. Fagey became chief of the CDC smallpox eradication program and was appointed director of CDC in 1977. He is the recipient of, of many awards, including being named a fellow of the London School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, and in 2012 was awarded the United States Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest civilian award given by the US government. He has served in executive positions at the Carter Center, the Task Force for Child Survival, and is currently the Presidential Distinguished Professor Emeritus of International Health at Emory University. Dr. Fagey also serves as senior fellow to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, advising the foundation on strategies to pursue in global health. Dr. Fagey has championed many issues, but child survival and development, injury prevention, population, preventive medicine, and public health leadership are of special interest, particularly in the developing world. He is a strong proponent of disease eradication and control, and has taken an active role in the eradication of guinea worm, polio, and measles, and the elimination of river blindness. By writing and lecturing extensively, Dr. Fagey has succeeded in broadening public health awareness of these issues and bringing them to the forefront of domestic and interna international health policies and action. Dr. Fagey is truly one of the greatest public health leaders of all time, so please join me in welcoming him back to CDC. Thank you, Tom. Uh, eight days ago, I was talking to students at the University of Minnesota, and I thought of a story that I hadn't thought about for years, and I told the story, but then forgot to tell them why I was telling the story. So <laughs> I want to tell that story again, but the reason I'm telling it is to think about what is the question you're trying to answer. So 40 years ago, a public health worker from, uh, from Washington, D.C. told me that he had gone to college in Iowa, his roommate was from Australia. The roommate was asked so often to speak at Rotary, at schools, at churches, and so forth. And it became pretty much a standard speech, standard questions and answers. 
He was invited one night to a Baptist church. When he finished speaking, a man got up and asked, are there many Baptists in Australia? What he heard was the question he'd heard so often, are there many rabbits in Australia? And he said, oh, good Lord, they're the national nuisance. And <laughs> he said, we hunt them and shoot them and poison them, <laughs> but they just keep reproducing. <laughs> so listening to the question, and the question I'm trying to answer is, do I have anything to offer in this area of security? And I'd like to touch on three things. What is some of the history? And it's important to think of the history because it's so common nowadays for everyone to be interested in global health. But who was interested before? These are the people you want to go to for cooperation. They have a vested interest. So what's some of the history? Number two, what are some of the things you might think of this week? Number three, why are you even doing this? So some global health history. There are, I'm just going to name these. I'm not going to talk about them. The church groups who did medical missions, of course, for many years. Then we have uh, the uh, military did so much good work trying to protect troops. We have the uh, colonial powers, and particularly the British and the French. The post-World War II area, when we had global agencies developing, WHO and UNICEF and, and CARE and so forth. Then the bilateral agencies with CETA and, and USAID and uh, DENITA and so forth. All kinds of NGOs, not by the hundreds, but by the thousands of, of NGOs. Foundations, some of them old, Rockefeller's 100 years old this year, some of them uh, much newer, like, such as the Gates Foundation. Academic interests. Then we have the recent chapter of corporations becoming interested. And I think this is one of the most exciting chapters in global health because the corporations can bring so much in the way of, of resources. And it started actually with Wyeth giving the patent for the bifurcated needle to WHO. Then Tata Industries in, in India becoming involved in smallpox eradication. But it was Merck that put this on a whole new level when in the 80s they decided to give Mectazan for the prevention of blindness due to onchocerciasis. And now all kinds of corporations, the Task Force for Global Health here in Atlanta, this year will get $2 billion worth of products from corporations for neglected uh, diseases. So there's been a great change. And in my lifetime, I've seen the number of children under five dying each day go from 50,000 to 16,000 a day. It's still obscene, but you can see the progress that has been made. And perhaps it took all of those inputs over the years to see the acceleration in the last 15 years. And I'm convinced when someone writes the history of global health, they'll say the tipping point was about the year 2000 due to two people, Melinda and Bill Gates. This changed everything, the way we looked at it. Because we always saw ourselves as being poor and we thought like poor people. It was always trying to get by on a shoestring, not thinking big. And the Gates Foundation allowed us to think big. At CDC, this global health history started, of course, with malaria during the Second World War. Troops coming to be trained in the South, they were getting malaria. And so the malaria program started with headquarters in Atlanta, which is why CDC is here. Then other tropical diseases besides malaria as troops were coming back, particularly from the South Pacific. Joe Mountain, who saw that with this group of scientists in Atlanta, that it could be something more than malaria and tropical diseases. And he's the one that pushed for the Communicable Disease Center. He had a broad vision of public health. He's the same person that started the Framingham study. So chronic diseases and infectious uh, diseases. Then the EIS program with Langmuir, responding to Korean hemorrhagic fever and the question, is this bioterrorism? In the 70s, I visited a virology lab in China. They interpreted Korean hemorrhagic fever the same way, but thought the US had introduced it. In both cases, virology really benefited in both countries because people put a lot of attention onto this. And of course, to train for bioterrorism, you train on all the regular diseases that you're encountering every day rather than just on bioterrorism diseases. In the early days, Congress was very uh, reluctant to put money into global health. They used to make us always justify everything 
on the basis of how does this help American health directly. And uh, this we would try to do, but it didn't always sell very well. There's some direct connections that I'll just mention very fast. In April, April 12, 1955, with the press conference at the University of Michigan announcing that the salt vaccine protected. And this was a big thing scientifically, but within days we had an even bigger historical event because the secretary of HEW, Mrs. Hobby, had come to Washington saying the government would not promote socialized medicine, therefore would not be doing anything in medicine. And when the American public found we now had a vaccine that would protect against polio, they asked, what's the government plan? And there was none. So President Eisenhower asked her to quickly come up with a plan and she had a press conference, announced that she would seek an appropriation to buy polio vaccine for poor children. Senator Lister Hill then had a press conference and said he would seek an appropriation to buy polio vaccine for all children. He said no child will have to declare themselves poor to be protected. This idea then changed from being just a protection of an individual to protection of an individual and society. 10 years later, Lyndon Johnson used that as the basis for the smallpox eradication program. And now we think in those terms, this is a social problem. And what you're dealing with uh, this week is a social problem. Dave Sensor understood this. Uh, he was the director of CDC, and he used all kinds of domestic money to support smallpox eradication because he said, I'm protecting the US uh, population. Now, concern for me started when I became director, and one day, someone from the post office walked into the smallpox lab looking for someone to deliver a package. And I said, you know, this isn't right. Uh, and so we started looking at a card system to get into to certain areas. But then I received a letter one morning and my assistant brought it in. She said, you better read this first. It was a letter from a person who said they were going to put botulinum toxin in a municipal water supply and suggested that I, I was interested in preventing that to put the following notice under the personal ads in the New York Times. I called the FBI, they put that into the New York Times, analyzed the letter, got a second letter. And then the FBI told me they were coming very close to figuring out where this letter had come from, they even knew what kind of typewriter and so forth. And then they called me one morning and said, the press has wind of this and someone will call you today, try to talk him out of doing the story. I tried to talk about how important it was for us to be able to, to follow up on this. And I said, we'll give you all the information first. You can write the story as soon as we have this person. But the story came out, we never heard from the person again. But that alerted me to the fact that we really do have a problem. And believe it or not, CDC 35 years ago developed a program for bioterrorism. We went through every disease and we tried to figure out how we could use this offensively and then what kind of defense would we need? We had a program with the FBI, secure phones, a secure room. We had a person at CDC for every organism. I mean, we really had a good program. Then someone later, when briefed on this program, after I left, briefed on this program said, that's never gonna happen, and he destroyed the program overnight. So we did not have that program when the anthrax uh, problem arose. Last thing I want to say is Bill Gates and Bill Clinton were on television one night and someone asked Bill Gates, why should we care about these diseases overseas and why should we put in, be putting our resources into it? And now you have to think of me at CDC all these years justifying everything on the basis of U.S. health and Bill Gates said because it's the right thing to do. And I thought, boy, if I could have said that over all these years. <laughs> and so in some ways we've come full circles from malaria security concerns for this country that started CDC to concerns about bioterrorism that started EIS and now concerns about this country and the world. So you're here both because it's the right thing 
because of fear. And I have said for a long time, we need to link the fears of the rich with the needs of the poor. And I tell you, this is one way you can do that. Uh, Will Durant said that uh, he suspected we would never get the countries to agree and cooperate unless they feared an alien invasion. And over the years, I've come to understand global health provides surrogates for an alien invasion. That's why we could work on smallpox. That's why we can work on AIDS. Bioterrorism is absolutely a surrogate for an alien invasion, and this is the way to get countries to work together. Things to think about. Well, as you're mapping out the big picture, and you won't be working on all of this this week or the next three months, of course, the security of infectious diseases is very important. Which ones get priority? What's the matrix approach? The impact of the problem? What would be the impact of the problem if it was introduced? What would be the impact of the problem if things were changed? What have you aerosolized rabies virus, for instance? Then what's the problem and how would you counter that? And the change in, in the epidemiology, the shared risks, Where's the science? What would it take to make the science better? With disease eradication, we used to ask which diseases could be eradicated, and we'd go through the list. Then we changed the question, what would it actually take to eradicate the disease? And we went through the entire list of diseases asking that question, because when you're done, you now have a research agenda for every disease. That's what we have to be thinking about with this. And what is the last mile? Where is the final point in trying to, to make this secure? But I would urge you to have in mind something broader than this. You won't have time to work on it this week, but beyond disease security, health security, malnutrition, environmental insults, safe water, healthcare delivery, and so forth. And then beyond that, be thinking about social security, education, work, social determinants, and especially poverty. But, and here's the one where you won't want to think about this, what could this do for peace? That is a big jump, but if you have that in mind, it will change the way that you're working. Think of the objectives in each area, systems to achieve that, surveillance, analysis, decision, and so forth. A major reason for surveillance systems is something we've learned over the years in public health. Know the truth. And oftentimes, we don't actually want to know the truth. In India, I think of October of 1973, when we tried for the first time doing a village by village search looking for smallpox. And I was so naive, so dumb, that in the instructions to the searchers, I said, you're not going to find much smallpox. It's the low level of transmission. But we're going to figure out how to do this. In six days' time, in two states alone, they found 10 thousand new cases of smallpox that we didn't know about. And some people said, let's not do this again. <laughs> but see, that's the difference between wanting to know the truth and not wanting to know the truth. And we said, we're going to do it again. We're going to do it in four weeks. And four weeks later, we found 4,000 new cases that we didn't know about. So know the truth. And part of knowing the truth is to use the latest technology. Two weeks ago, I visited a startup in Palo Alto, and some of you probably know it, uh, Theranos. Elizabeth Holmes is the head of this, and what she has done, she's made it possible to make a diagnosis on 2,000 conditions with one drop of blood. I mean, this is nanotechnology to the ultimate. 2,000, and she can get an answer on those 2,000 in 30 minutes. And so instead of having an unknown in a rural area of Africa and having to figure out how to get that specimen into a lab and then how to get a diagnosis, in 30 minutes you could have that right there and it can be sent uh, by, uh, digitally so that you have a built-in surveillance system every time you do this test. I mean, I asked her, as you're doing tests in the United States, the doctor's asking for these 20 things or 30 things, could you also add flu on your own and send that directly to CDC? This would give you real-time information on where the flu is 
in this country and around the world. So this is worth looking at. She can do anti antibodies, antigens. She can even tell you the resistance pattern of the organism. I mean, this is just a breakthrough that we have to figure out how to, to use. And she's more than willing to be involved in this. OK, finally, why are you doing this? Well, biological terror, of course, unintentional terror, 1918 flu, Korean hemorrhagic fever, SARS, HIV, but intentional also. And this is the way, as I said, EIS started. But this has been, there's been a big change since EIS. The world has become more asymmetrical in the sense that one person or a few people can cause mass destruction for many people. And we have to be able to figure that out very quickly and make it so professional what you do this week that uh, it not only protects others, but that others don't necessarily find ways to counteract what you're doing. Another reason for doing this, and this now is the leap that you may not want to take, is think of peace. To define health, you start with individual health and then to family health, community health, and national health, global health. It's the same with peace. You're talking about individual peace and family peace and, and all the way up. To define health or peace, you have to do that. Peace is more likely if you learn how to work across cultural boundaries. During the Cold War, I actually supervised Soviets in India who in turn supervised other Americans. I can't think of any other realm other than health where you could actually have done that during the Cold War. So you have a wedge issue here for peace that you have to exploit. You can't just say, no, we're interested in infectious diseases and we're not interested in the bigger picture. So use your activities to find more surrogates for the uh, alien invasion. A few thoughts. William Penn said to heal the world is true religion. People in trouble don't need more trouble. And also, think of the dysfunction of our global health system. No one likes to talk about that. But for many things, WHO, for instance, there is no alternative. If we didn't have WHO, we'd have to create WHO. But that doesn't mean it can't be made better. And when I think of how we have strapped WHO, can you believe in a board of directors of 190 people? I mean, it, this just doesn't make sense. And then when WHO started, it was the US that insisted on strong regional offices because we were trying to protect PAHO. And so what happens now, it's very difficult for Geneva to make decisions that really make a difference because of strong regional offices. We should be able to say, okay, we have 65 years of experience. Let's step back and ask, how do we wish things had developed and could we change them now? Some lessons for peace. It's possible to plan a rational future. If that wouldn't be possible, we wouldn't be dealing with this at all. We wouldn't be dealing with global health or public health, and you wouldn't have all gone to school. I mean, the fact that you're sitting here, you are not fatalists. So uh, we have to get that straight first. I talk to students about fatalism and the fact that about a third of Americans are fatalistic in the sense they don't think they can do anything about their future. In some countries, it's as high as 80%. And for all of us, it varies day by day what we're involved in, how fatalistic we feel. And I tell students, I feel most fatalistic when I get in a taxi. And if I just feel like I've <laughs> lost control of my future. And, the, and I tell them about getting into a taxi at 11.30 at night in Philadelphia, going to the hotel, and it's not that far. But on the freeway at 11.30 at night, realizing I was smelling alcohol. So I decided to engage the driver and see how impaired the driver was. And I said to the driver, you should know that I'm a high risk passenger. And he asked, what does that mean? I said, well, I've been in five taxi accidents in my life, which was true. And he said, oh, that's nothing. I've been in a lot more than that. <laughs> Now, Rousseau once said, half of all children will die by their eighth birthday. This is nature's law. Do not try to contradict it. 
but we contradict that every day. And so we have to be clear about fatalism and what we can do about the future. But peace like health will be a process, always relative, always amenable to improvement. And there's a direct connection, of course, better health increases the environment for peace. And there are tools of global health. Have you ever thought about how you could use epidemiology to study conflict? We tried this at the Carter Center. 120 conflicts around the world at the time we did this. 30 of them had more than 1,000 uh, deaths in uh, civilians. And we tried to figure out what's happening with each conflict. Why do some of them disappear? Why do new ones appear? That's worth putting money into and getting some of the best epidemiologists to follow this and figure out how to decrease the chance of conflict. A concentrated approach to global health was not robust four decades ago. Things do change. A robust approach to peace is possible. The placebo effect in medicine we all are aware of, and that is an improvement that's beyond what you can describe scientifically. It doesn't mean that it's magic, it just means we don't understand it scientifically. What's the placebo effect for big social events? It's hope. And you will give hope to people by the fact that you're studying this and trying to come up with more secure approaches. We're all aware of and wary of people who rewrite history. And politicians occasionally will do that. Uh, by the way, last week I was in a rot rotary meeting and someone was pointing out that pro and con are just opposites. Therefore, the opposite of progress must be Congress. And uh, <laughs> So we're aware of people rewriting history, but I tell students that's exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to rewrite history, but before it happens. That's what you're trying to do this week, rewrite history before it happens. When you're engaged in peace efforts, you're trying to rewrite history before it happens. And finally, uh, the last point that I want to make is that all of this searching for peace requires an improvement in civilization. Schools are very good at transmitting knowledge, but values and civilization are transferred by mentors. And so find mentors and be mentors. And a good criterion of civilization turns out to be how people treat each other. Civilization is actually organized kindness. So in the midst of a scientific process this week, just think far beyond what you've been assigned to what does this mean for peace. And the last point, there's a book called Cutting for Stone and there is a line in there that I love, that home is not where you're from. Home is where you're needed. And you've all found your home in global health. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Fagey, for that, that wisdom and experience. And uh, just a reminder, we'll have a chance to have a dialogue with, with Dr. Fagey along with our, our next two speakers in, in a moment. Um, beginning in 2013, CDC began two global health security demonstration projects in, in Uganda and Vietnam in order to demonstrate what can be done in, in three areas of focus? Emergency operation centers, information technology platforms, and national laboratory systems for better disease detection. So overviews of, of these demonstration projects will now be given by two CDC overseas staff who were instrumental to the success of the uh, demonstration projects. I'd first like to introduce Dr. Michelle McConnell, the country director of CDC Vietnam from the Division of Global HIV AIDS. She was the lead and country coordinator for the demonstration project in Vietnam. And I'd also like to introduce Dr. Jeff Borchert from CDC Uganda and the Division of Vector-Borne Diseases in the National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases. Michelle will first present on Vietnam, 
uh, Jeff on Uganda, and then we'll have all the morning speakers come up to the stage for questions and discussion. So, Michelle? Good morning. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the demonstration project in Vietnam. And so for those of you um, that are not entirely familiar with Asia and perhaps spent a lot of time in Africa, I'm gonna give you a bit of orientation first. Vietnam is bordered by China to the north and to Laos and Cambodia to the west. It has quite a long border with urban hubs in Hanoi and Hanorth and Ho Chi Minh City in the south. 10 years ago, Vietnam faced the SARS epidemic, and it was one of the first countries to contain new cases. Over the years since then, the Vietnamese have contended with numerous cases of H5N1 influenza and other infectious diseases. The Ministry of Health is attuned to the importance of global health security in general, and they work closely with WHO and other international partners to meet the international health regulations. And when the first cases of H7N9 were reported in China last spring, about the time we started this demonstration project, the Vietnam Ministry of Health responded quickly to engage stakeholders and prepare for possible cases in Vietnam. So before I go into the specifics of what was done as part of the demonstration project, I wanna give you a little background on Vietnam and the context for the three lanes that we worked in, emergency operations and laboratory and information systems. In Vietnam, under the Communist Party system, official laws and decrees are important. And this is both an incredible opportunity and in some cases also a limitation. These laws are a framework and a legal authority for public health institutions. For example, Circular 48 details what diseases and pathogens should be reported and how. There's an agreement between the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development on the reporting of infectious diseases. And there is already in existence a National Steering Committee for Emerging Disease Prevention and Control. This committee has the authority and function to lead emergency operations. So the photo on the right is the designated EOC space at the General Department of Preventive Medicine at the Ministry of Health in Hanoi. And at the beginning of the demonstration project, the Ministry of Health already had this EOC space and they had EOC staff. The staff had prescribed roles along with the National Steering Committee which were fulfilled each time there was an emergency event that occurred. In terms of laboratory capability, Vietnam has four regional public health institutes, all of which participate in national surveillance systems, including for influenza and enterovirus 71 or EV71. Of note, EV71 has been associated with frequent large outbreaks of hand, foot, and mouth disease in Vietnam, and particularly encephalitis. And this has resulted in numerous deaths among children, and so it's of consequence to the Ministry of Health. The largest two public health institutes in Vietnam are Pasteur Institute in Ho Chi Minh City in the south, and the National Institute for Hygiene and Epidemiology, or NIHE, in Hanoi. And this is also where the two national influenza centers are also located, and where CDC's influenza division has worked closely for a number of years to build surveillance and testing capability. In general, these public health institutes have relatively good infrastructure and laboratory systems in place. That said, laboratory capability becomes less as you go down to the provincial and district levels in Vietnam. And even at the regional public health labs, sample tracking and reporting systems are not fully electronic. And in many cases, there are different approaches and protocols among the four different regional public health labs. And finally, in terms of information systems, just by way of background, in Vietnam, aggregate surveillance data are collected on paper on 28 reportable conditions, and this is done nationally in all 63 provinces in Vietnam. These data are collated at the provincial preventive medicine centers, sent to the regional institutes, and then transmitted to the general department of preventive medicine. Hospitals and clinics also report communicable disease cases to the preventive systems, and there are sentinel surveillance systems in place for certain reportable diseases. Finally, there is in existence an electronic communicable disease surveillance system, or ECDS, and at the time of the demonstration, this was in place in 48 provinces, although there was limited IT capacity and skills at the lower levels of the health system. 
so from the beginning of the demonstration project, CDC and the Ministry of Health worked to build on existing systems. Vietnam has a large number of donor-driven projects, and the intent with this GHS was to build on the Ministry of Health's systems, capabilities, and structures so that the enhancements that were put in place with global health security would be sustainable and would be aligned with the ministry's priorities and systems. In short, there were already a lot of institutional systems in place, but they weren't optimally functional or connected, and so our goal was really to do better and faster. In terms of the process, the first step was really to review the current Ministry of Health capacity and the partner inputs, and I've given you some background already on that. We also looked at the various CDC program activities in Vietnam as platforms to build on and continue to strengthen, including the SARI and ILI surveillance that's supported by the Influenza Division, and under PEPFAR, an electronic lab information system, a national laboratory strategic plan, and a public health informatics lab. There have also been varying supports to the FETP program in Vietnam over the years from CDC. So the draft plan was developed with assistance from subject matter experts at headquarters. And then with input from the Ministry of Health, the plan was formally approved by the ministry within one month of project initiation. And the final step was really the how, which included mechanisms for staffing and procurement, travel, and other assistance. So what was done? As I said, while the EOC space existed, it was not formally recognized by the Ministry of Health. And so the ministry first formally established this office with members from different Ministry of Health departments, the regional institutes, and relevant international agencies. A core EOC team was established at the ministry, and a handbook and SOPs were developed for the operations. And these were tailored to the existing policies of Vietnam. Six Ministry of Health staff were trained on EOC systems, both here in Atlanta and um, at WHO in Wipro in Manila. In the lab, three indicator tests were prioritized for the demonstration. They were EV71, influenza, including H7N9, and an expanded respiratory panel, which include MERS coronavirus. Laboratory capacity was assessed at the two national influenza centers and enterovirus labs at Nihei and Pester Institute. And training was provided by subject matter experts on assay performance, which included a new real-time RT-PCR, new equipment and software, and proficiency testing. Lab equipment and supplies were procured, standardized SOPs were developed. And then finally, getting back to the theme of interconnectivity of the system, mapping of the public health laboratory network was initiated using the GLADMAP program to designate different levels of responsibility for labs and to strengthen the overall network in terms of sample shipment, testing, reporting, and referral. In the information systems lane, again, the, the goal was to build on the capabilities of the existing system. With that in mind, outbreak investigation tools were created in EpiInfo 7 in Vietnamese, and then to allow the field investigation to flow to the EOC, the Ministry of Health, Regional Institutes, and provincial staff were trained in these systems, with a Hanoi School of Public Health being designated as the nodal EpiInfo Training Institute for Vietnam. Outbreak investigation software for mobile devices was created, allowing the collection of case investigation data. And finally, real-time presentation of surveillance data were demonstrated, again, as an enhancement to the existing communicable disease surveillance system. I'm not gonna walk you through this colorful graphic, but at the conclusion of the demonstration drill, uh, the demonstration rather, a drill was conducted with support from CDC and DOD DITRA subject matter experts. And this is just a graphic showing the timeline of these sequential drills. Mock drill panels consisted of inactivated virus that were supplied by CDC and the Oxford University Clinical Research Unit, which is a partner in Vietnam. For the laboratory drill, Nihei successfully identified the pathogens that were presented to it in the allowable time frame. And for them, it specifically incurred H7N9, MERS coronavirus, and a seasonal influenza virus. And Pasteur Institute in Ho Chi Minh City also successfully demonstrated or identified the pathogens that they were given, which was H5N1 and EV71. 
That said, areas that were identified for improvement in the laboratory area as part of the drill included streamlining, logging and reporting systems across the laboratories, and the need to standardize SOPs and protocols for diagnosis. The EUC drill, which was done separately from the lab drills, brought together the various Ministry of Health departments and institutes. And with GDPM, the General Department of Preventive Medicine, as the lead, they managed a hypothetical infectious disease outbreak that was similar to what would have occurred in an international type EOC. Again, lessons learned here were around coordination and communication among the different departments in the ministry in a manner that was different than their usual operations. And they also learned how to operate and manage the EOC. So as we move forward, that said, there's much more to do. There are additional activities here planned for the EOC up in Hanoi at the General Department of Preventive Medicine. For the laboratory, which includes the other two regional public health institutes. And finally, for the information systems, which is really the piece that ties everything together. Again, I think one of the greatest challenges to global health security in Vietnam is not the capability within an institution or department within the Ministry of Health, but rather the connections and the communication between departments and institutions. And that's why the linking of these pieces is really critical. At CDC, we are continuing to develop plans and mechanisms for these activities in collaboration with other partners, such as DITRA, USAID, WHO, and others. And the Ministry of Health also continues to advance global health security. For example, in the months since the conclusion of the demonstration project, with continued cases of H7N9 reported in China, the Ministry of Health National Sub-Steering Committee has convened to prepare a response to H7. Additionally, the Electronic Communicable Disease Surveillance System has now been expanded to all 63 provinces by the Ministry of Health, and they are currently upgrading the server system for improved data transmission. And I think this speaks to one of the positive outcomes of the Global Health Security Demonstration Project, which was a reaffirmation of the importance of global health security within the Ministry of Health and the identification by them of necessary actionable steps for improvement. And finally, I want to just say a few words about collaborations within CDC because this was an important contributor to the success of the demonstration. Um, this is not an all-inclusive or comprehensive listing of contributors to global health security. This is an example. Um, but much of the global health security activities in Vietnam built on the ongoing work and relationships that were established by programs such as the Division of Global HIV AIDS under PEPFAR and the Influenza Division which have programs in Vietnam pre-existing. Other divisions and centers at CDC contributed significant amounts of staff time and expertise to make the demonstration a success, including the Center for Surveillance and Epidemiology, Division of Emergency Operations, Division of Viral Diseases, and many others. But if we turn this around, we've also seen that the global health security activities have advanced the work of some of these other CDC divisions. The Ministry of Health sees global health security as a framework for action and a health systems need, and not as a disease or a pathogen. And it is a high priority for them. So as a result of the GHS activities, some of the pathogen and project-specific activities that CDC Vietnam has been working on, such as the laboratory information systems and public health informatics supported by the PEPFAR program, have engaged broader stakeholders engagement beyond HIV, as the relevance for these lab and information systems to the general health system have become more apparent. And in turn, this has increased sustainability and ownership within Vietnam of these platforms. So to conclude, enhancements from the demonstration are concrete steps towards increased global health security, and they build on existing Ministry of Health systems. With that in mind, implementation plans must be tailored to local priorities. Many partners and stakeholders are already working in Vietnam, including USAID, DITRA, and WHO, and coordination and information sharing is critical. At a headquarters level, a horizontal approach to global health security across the agency has had value in leveraging the partnerships and activities of other ongoing CDC programs and in turn, strengthening and sustaining those programs. 
And finally, political will is vital with ambassadors as valuable advocates and with the US role as a complement to multilateral IHR framework. And there were probably 50 to 100 people that helped with this demonstration project. I couldn't begin to list them all. Um, thank you to everyone um, that worked on this. And this is just a, a summary of some of the organizations that were a critical part of this demonstration. Um, and with that, I'll conclude. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, I'd like to start my talk off with uh, just a quick overview of CDC Uganda. Um, it's a pretty big office there. We have uh, 127 staff positions, uh, with 106 of those being locally employed staff and 21 direct hires. Um, all these positions aren't filled yet, um, but the majority of them are. Uh, the office oversees um, a budget of just over $160 million. And as you'd expect, uh, the majority of it is in HIV work um, along with PEPFAR. There's also um, significant um, representation from other groups, including PMI, uh, the Viral Special Pathogens Branch, uh, the Division of Vector-Borne Diseases, and the Immunization Group. Um, we're also planning on starting an FET program at the end of 2014, and I've been told that the resident advisor for that has already been chosen. And lastly, we are in early discussions with the Ministry of Health about uh, the National Public Health Institute um, that they're interested in starting in this country. There's high interest of global health security within the U.S. mission there. The ambassador in Uganda has um, a high interest in pandemic preparedness, and he uh, chairs uh, what's called the interagency health team. And this group is an interagency group that oversees the $428 million budget um, in Uganda uh, for health. And this number represents two-thirds of the overall budget in Uganda. And in this group is a number of different technical working groups, including the Disease Outbreak Working Group, which is co-chaired by CDC and uh, EPT. So under the demonstration project, um, which was between April and September 13, we sought to do uh, three different things. The first was to strengthen uh, disease surveillance system capacity for detection of disease, specimen referral, and laboratory confirmation of three diseases. And these diseases were, um, were chosen after a lot of discussion with the Ministry of Health and going over their plans and over their um, priorities. And so the three were MDR and XDR-TB, cholera, and then they chose um, Ebola as representative for um, viral hemorrhagic fevers. Secondly, we sought to establish a functional public health emergency operations center. And thirdly, enhance information systems to enable real-time monitoring of epidemics and response, and then coordinating that all through the um, emergency operations center. So we built on a, a number of existing efforts um, already in country, and the first and foremost was um, the Ministry of Health's own plans um, for disease surveillance there. Uh, the MOH uses IDSR to implement a IHR in, um, in Uganda, and our uh, global health security activities fit well within um, their IDSR uh, rollout, five-year rollout plan. Uh, there's three main laboratories in Uganda. Uh, the Central Public Health Laboratory is in Kampala and focuses mainly on bacterial diseases. Um, secondly, the Uganda Virus Research Institute in Entebbe focuses on virus, viruses. And thirdly, the Supranational TB Reference Laboratory in Kampala. <clears throat> There were a number of uh, PEPFAR investments already in country, and uh, our project was uh, uh, leveraged many of these, including um, enhancing the online District Health Information 2 system. And what this is is a web-based um, health information software that's open source uh, that is used by a number of different countries down um, in this map in the lower right. Um, <clears throat> It's been used for HIV for a number of years and is one of the accepted electronic tools for health information collection in Uganda. Secondly, we leveraged the, the already existing support for district surveillance officers to investigate and report disease events and report these using SMS and through DHIS2. 
Thirdly, we utilized um, a transportation network that was set up for uh, early infant HIV uh, diagnosis. And this, uh, we'll talk about this um, a bit more, but it's a motorcycle and bus system uh, to collect samples from upcountry. Lastly, we uh, leveraged uh, the NTRL's TB gene expert rollout and testing scheme. As I mentioned on that first slide, um, there had been significant investments from other groups in Uganda, and two particularly from EZID, a viral special pathogens group and Division of Vector-Borne Diseases, um, Diseases have made significant investments in laboratory and surveillance activities. We also um, capitalized on WHO's activity uh, with AFRICOL, which um, was set up to support culture-based uh, confirmation of cholera at regional hospitals. And lastly, we worked with Afinet, um, who up until last year had managed this Africol project. This map on the left um, shows the coverage of uh, our GHS project districts um, that we uh, chose with a consultation from the Ministry of Health. Many of these are in northern Uganda. It's in an area where there uh, historically had been unrest and there had been uh, quite a lack of public health infrastructure. Um, and they wanted to focus on these areas. Um, secondly, this map is a schematic of the EID uh, catchment areas for the transportation networks. And the way the Ministry of Health did this is they drew a 50 kilometer circle around each of these regional hubs and any upcountry health clinic that was included within that area would be included in the transportation network. And take note of this one kind of halfway down on the right side, it's Mbali district, um, right there on the eastern border. When we break that down a little bit more, you can see how this uh, transportation hub works. Uh, this map here on the left shows uh, the schedule for motorcycle collection of, um, of samples from each of the upcountry clinics. So each of those colors represents a day uh, of the week. And so on Mondays, they go one place. On Tuesdays, they go a different route. And these guys drive about 150 to 200 kilometers per day. <clears throat> and what happens is these samples are then taken back to a hub. They're then um, packaged and put on a bus system, which then goes to Kampala. And this bus system is what runs the, the mail transport within Uganda. So all these roads lead always to Kampala. In each of the districts, we, we performed a modified WHO laboratory assessment tool um, in each of the district laboratories to look at a baseline um, assessment of performance of each of these um, institutions. We then um, mentored the labs and provided training on sample collection and transport of these three priority diseases. And so um, the the algorithms that we set up are here. For suspect uh, viral hemorrhage fever cases, um, we first isolated um, potential patients, took a specimen, and then transported that sample um, by the bus system to CPHL, which was a clearinghouse for these samples, and then on to UVRI and Entebbe. Um, for TB, um, we would collect the samples uh, by a motorcyclist, um, which were then taken to the nearest gene expert site. They were tested. Anything that had the potential to be XDR um, TB was then packaged and sent uh, to the central laboratory, which was then moved on uh, to the national TB laboratory. For cholera, we pre-positioned rapid diagnostic tests into 17 district health facilities. Um, so when samples were collected in upcountry, they were then moved to these regional sites tested, and if they needed to be, uh, they were sent to CPHL on the bus system. Our goal for the IT component of this project um, was to improve the real-time detection, transport, and confirmation through uh, new DHIS2 modules, um, disease-specific modules that we set up for each of the three priority diseases. Uh, these laboratory results were then interlinked via the EOC through SMS and online reporting through DHIS2. And we developed dashboards for each of these uh, diseases and reports for, um, for these diseases could be accessed um, 
to any of the stakeholders in the health system at all levels on a need to know basis. And there's an example here of one of the dashboards for cholera. And the way this works is that upcountry data would be entered at the regional site. So when there was a suspect case, it was put on this DHIS2 system. Um, and then it was tracked as it went throughout uh, the transportation network. So at each step in the central lab, um, when the bus reached Kampala, it was then uploaded into DHIS2, and then it moved on to the, um, to the, di the diagnostic lab. Um, it was then, um, uploaded that it had been received, and then any sample results were also uploaded. With the Emergency Operations Center, we looked to establish one of appropriate size and scope. And so what we did is we uh, linked this activity with a PEPFAR-supported resource center. The Ministry of Health um, uh, Resource Center uh, is the uh, agency within the ministry that collects all health data, um, whether it be HIV or surveillance data, and compiles it um, for the other groups to use. So we found a, um, a rental space across the street from the Ministry of Health, and this is a schematic design of, of how it was set up. Um, we're hoping to uh, create a permanent facility uh, that will be housed with the National Health Laboratory and Compound near Kampala. And this is a, a picture of the National Health Lab in the bottom right. This is being built right now, and uh, it's supposed to be done at the end of this year or early next year. And we hope to potentially have a third building that could house an EOC as well as other groups from the Ministry of Health. The point of the the EOC was to coordinate the public health response from a centralized location. And so really it was to receive and analyze and monitor outbreak information in real time. And then be able to take that information and provide it to um, decision makers and policy makers, which in Uganda is what's called the National Task Force. And this is set up for each outbreak where the National Task Force, National Task Force meets and then um, does the outbreak response. So the GHS project in Uganda was successful in building capacity to prevent, detect, and respond to these three priority diseases. And it was mainly in these three areas of nationwide lab network where we focused on sample collection, transport, and then sample analysis. In the middle, real-time information system, which uh, for the backbone of that was SMS reporting and DHIS2. And then thirdly, um, the establishment of this emergency operations center as the central hub. And these are photographs of, of the emergency operations center. It was commercial space across the street from the Ministry of Health. And uh, these are pictures of, uh, of the inside. And you can see in the lower right-hand corner, there's um, space for um, our four full-time staff. Uh, that middle picture uh, on the right side um, shows workstations that can be used for incident management teams uh, when uh, the EOC is activated and there's people staying there. Uh, and then this... Uh, Picture on the left here is the situation room. There's four staff that we support, um, uh, EOC manager, a GHS person, and a DHIS2 technician. The Ministry of Health provided admin support and a vehicle for the EOC. And our EOC is, is linked now with uh, the newly established um, Office of the Prime Minister, National Emergency Coordination and Operations Center. And this was funded by UNDP. And coincidentally, this all happened at the same exact time that we were doing um, our GHS project. So other specific achievements um, within our project included uh, the development of SOPs and protocols um, within the EOC. As I said earlier, we established uh, disease-specific modules within DHIS2. Uh, we performed an exercise drill in 2013 with the help of DITRA. And, and through this exercise, we evaluated the specimen transport, the SMS communication system, DHIS2, and EOC management of a mock response. We had uh, noted successes in uh, the timely delivery of samples to National Referent Lab laboratories within uh, 24 hours, and the utility of these suspect case uh, response modules in DHIS2. And so the EOC was really able to, to, to monitor this mock response um, as, as we went through the process of the exercise. 
And since the demonstration project, um, we've seen a pretty substantial increase in the use of this transportation network and the use of DHIS2. Um, we've had a, a, a substantial increase in the number of samples coming through the different laboratories, um, particularly at UVRI and Entebbe. And the EOC has developed um, an event-based surveillance system that includes the evaluation of media reports, and they recently established access to Canada's uh, Global Public Health Intelligence Network. The EOC has been activated a few times uh, since the demonstration project. Uh, the first time uh, was in October uh, to monitor for um, symptoms consistent with MERS coronavirus of uh, pilgrims returning from the Hajj. Um, secondly, it was activated for a mass gathering event uh, in northern Uganda. It was a solar eclipse, and that was in early November. And then this month, the EOC is going to be activated um, to respond to um, a new initiative for um, elimination of mother-to-child to transmission of HIV. So right now, we're just working through the nuances of, of activating the EOC for a chronic disease versus an epidemic-prone disease. And the EOC was activated on um, February 11th for a current outbreak of meningitis in northwest Uganda. And these are the districts that are being covered. And there's one, that little white one in the middle, that's now red um, as of last week. Uh, the EOC group um, was able to recognize some problems um, with uh, this outbreak and the transportation network of samples. Um, a lot of these districts weren't included in our GHS um, pilot project, and so they weren't utilizing that um, EID transportation network. And so we were able to set that up so that um, these districts could then um, send samples to the Central Public Health Laboratory. Secondly, our group has uh, developed a disease-specific module for meningitis within um, DHIS2. And so our next steps are to conduct uh, incident management training with our key staff in the EOC, um, to train rapid response teams um, in the regional areas, and then also to focus on the lowest level, which is the village health teams, um, training them for disease containment and reporting. We're looking to establish um, sentinel surveillance sites. Um, we've already just started one up in northwest Uganda, and we're looking at um, at possibilities of um, opening some of these other sites throughout um, other areas of the country. We'd like to re-administer the laboratory assessment tool, and we're looking to um, incorporate RFID tracking um, in, into our specimen shipments, and so putting an RFID tag within these cool boxes so that it can be tracked from the upcountry areas into the central labs. We hope to perform another exercise drill to test our um, our response capabilities again during this year. And most importantly, we hope to expand this GHS model um, beyond the 17 pilot districts into 23 new districts this year. Um, this map on the right shows um, the EID hubs. Um, the ones in the red were um, the first 19 that were established. And so the blue ones are now what the Ministry of Health added this last year. So they're up to 78 sites now. And so there's a lot of areas where we could potentially roll this out. And this map on here shows uh, 21 of the next 23 districts. We're still talking with the Ministry of Health about the remaining two. Um, we're also hoping to um, expand um, some of the, DH, uh, the DHIS2 modules that we've built um, to potentially be used in other countries. Um, some of the um, GHS rollout countries are also using DHIS2. And so if you're here from one of those countries and you're interested in what we did with DHIS2, we're certainly willing to, to talk about it. Um, our group is also interested in developing um, an EOC management model uh, module within DHIS2. So we're kind of looking at some of the commercially available um, software that's out there and looking to see if it'd be worth um, building one of our own. And then lastly, we're going to add um, additional um, uh, diagnostics at UVRI. So we're going to add these in uh, to the DHIS2 system. And so you can imagine there was a lot of people involved, and this is uh, kind of an overview of everyone that contributed uh, significantly to this project. And uh, I'd like to thank all of them for, uh, for their input on this. Thank you.